Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we're going to have a great discussion today because we're going to get into some things that oftentimes are let's just say underneath the surface level or in your subconscious mind, uh, but really uh, are the differentiating factors in between, you know, those that are doing a decent job and quite frankly, those that are not doing a good job at all and those that are exceptional. And we're going to untap those things and unlock those things because we have Stephen McGarvey on the show with us today. Now, Stephen McGarvey was born in Belfast, Ireland uh, and immigrated to Canada with his family when he was four years old settling in the greater Toronto area. Stephen grew up with his mother and father and two siblings. His family fostered his faith in God and encouraged his curiosity and determination. He is continuously inspired by his wife, Natalie, whose unconditional love and support have been instrumental to his success and happiness. An admirer of Harry Houdini, uh, Stephen loves the subject of magic and has even been known to wow an audience with his sleight of hand tricks. Stephen also loves to travel, and he and Natalie have enjoyed many world cruises and adventures together, exploring new cuisines and cultures and meeting fascinating people. Although successful now, Stephen faced challenging challenges early on. As a child, he struggled in school, and after being told he had a learning disability, he failed grade two. Still, Stephen preserved and continued his lifelong love of reading and learning, and it was propelled by a fascination with how different people think and process information. As a mature student, Stephen entered university to study interior design and halfway through his degree discovered the field of neurolinguistics and hypnosis, topics that ignited his curiosity. Fascinated, he changed his focus of study to neurolinguistics. After graduating, Stephen began a private practice in counseling and coaching. One of his clients was a corporate trainer who found his technique so helpful that she asked him to speak at her company's sales and marketing event. Stephen enjoyed that experience so much that in 2001, he and Natalie launched Solutions in Mind, a boutique consulting firm specializing in the psychology of persuasion and influence. The team at Solutions in Mind helps people understand how their brain works, that thinking impacts emotion, which drives behavior. Now, 21 years later, Stephen is an internationally renowned speaker and best-selling author whose expertise is relied on by C-suite leaders and their teams worldwide. Stephen's current release is Ignite a Shift, Engaging Minds, Guiding Emotions, and Driving Behavior. Stephen loves being able to positively impact how people think and communicate, and through the success of his business, he and Natalie can give to several charities like Radanac International, which supports survivors of human trafficking. Stephen currently lives in Oakville, Ontario with his wife, Natalie. Stephen McGarvey, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Always, Jim. Great to be here. Great to uh, have the conversation with you. And, and man, I'm looking forward to this conversation uh, because for me, you know, going through Ignite a Shift, um, I hit a lot of things just kind of like even talking in your bio. It's like, you know, oh, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Hey, I see where I struggle. I mean, all those types of things are so important. But, you know, it, and, and in the book, you talk about a couple different, you know, things that were, were those struggles for you. One is you say this book gave you painful flashbacks. Why? I think, Jim, failing grade two and being told I was learning disabled, having dyslexia, uh, reading out loud was one of my biggest fears in school. I I still remember, uh, maybe you're too young for this, but we sat in a circle and kind of read a paragraph each and we'd we'd go around and and take turns. And I remember I would count the number of people ahead of me, scan down and then practice in my head that paragraph. And the worst thing that would happen is the person just before me got a short paragraph. Paragraph, did a good job and the teacher would say oh whoever jim uh 
Bobby Sue, whatever the person's name was. You did such a great job. Read the next paragraph as well. And that threw me completely off because then I was like literally sweating and, and panicking to some extent because I hadn't had a chance to read that that other paragraph. So I, I think when I when you ask me about this triggering things, I, I think writing a book for me was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. If it wasn't for the requests and demand from our clients, uh, I don't think it's something I would ever put on my goal list because sitting down and actually going through that 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 process of getting my thoughts out into writing and, and making it flow in, in, in a linear fashion is uh, it just triggered all of that stuff from when I was younger in school. Um, and, and thank God I had a, a great team around me that, uh, that helped where I could do a lot of it. I could, I could do what we're doing. I could sit and, and talk it through and then I would have somebody capture it and then we would go back through it and, and tweak it and, and make sure it was all accurate. So I, I think that's, that's really the, uh, what I, what I meant when I said it, it triggered those flashbacks. It was just those challenges that we, you know, if if we're smart enough, we push ourselves through it and we find a way. And and I think really that's what uh, part of, in part, what, what the book is about. Okay, well, I have to call BS on you on that as far as the pushing through it, because that's not the way it works. And I think your book actually kind of reveals a lot of that. It's not pushing through it. Um, it it's actually taking a step back, doing some self-reflection, looking at what works for others, looking what doesn't work, you know, for others looking and see what doesn't work for you. There's a whole lot of things um, that for me, it's, I, I mean, I think it's more, oh, even more math than it is, you know, art. Uh, it's interesting you say that, Jim. You're telling me that in all of your career, you haven't had those moments where you felt like giving up and you had to just have that grit and that determination and that stick to it to push through? Um, well, here's the thing. If, if it's if, to me, and this is where I think you find so fat to me when, when I look at this book and what I find so fascinating is that we can only draw what's been put in our well right now. Well, how, what gets put in our well? Uh, well, there's experiences, um, there's, you know, learnings, um, there's stories that are being shared by others. And then ultimately we have to start making connections, uh, in order to be able to solve those problems. If not, we will put ourselves in the exact same situation, have the exact same anxiety and panic, and it just snowballs and it gets worse. At some point, we need to take a step back and say, hmm, you know, this uh, banging my head through it, it ain't working too well. Yeah. And, and to that point, I agree with you 100%. It's, it's less about banging our heads. It's about having that grit and that determination to learn from others, to learn from our past experiences, and to apply those learnings as we move forward in a direction. And I, I think when I say, you know, pushing through or, or that determination, that, that's what I mean. It's really that, that ability to evaluate, to glean learnings from our past experiences, to take learnings from those around us that are doing something exceptionally well, and then to apply that as we move toward our goals. And that's what I think you've done so well in this book. Oh, thank you. It's funny, Jim, I got an email on the weekend that really just made my whole weekend. And it was from one of our a new corporate clients. And he's a head of marketing. And he, he wrote me this email. He said, I, I just want to let you know, 100%, I'm, you know, don't read that much. And he said, uh, I, I'm just loving your book. And we, they, we just gave them a bunch of them or they bought a bunch of them uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he said, I'm just loving your book. He said, my wife comes out in the morning with a coffee slightly after me. And she said, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, what do you mean? She said, this is so unlike you to sit and read a book. He said, I got to tell you, it's honestly that good. <laughs> so I said, you just made my day. Like that's the response we want from people is to, enjoy it, enjoy the journey of reading it and, and get something out of each chapter that even for somebody who's not a, a, an avid reader, I, I never was, I, I always avoided reading because I would stumble through and it would take me a long time to get through a page. And I became a voracious reader once I discovered a subject matter that I was passionate about. Uh, th that's very true. Uh, so for me, um, I think anybody who deals with human beings uh, as part of their everyday life as well as their professional life, which to me, when you start thinking about that, um, that has now become almost everybody. I mean, a very, very large percentage um, is you have to really understand uh, all of, of the things that you, you have in this book and start building uh, skills and acquiring skills and then moving to the point of mastery if you want to be more effective. Um, and so what that means is, you know, the, the persuasion, influence, the science, all of those things around it are vitally important. 
And you say that there's one thing that lies at the heart of uh, influence and persuasion. What is that? I always say that the prerequisite to influence and persuasion is rapport. So that one thing that lies at the heart is that ability to connect with people, that ability to give people that experience of being understood. And when we have that, I, I think that's the key cornerstone. That's the foundation. That's the thing that's essential. And, and Jim, the, the irony is that that can be used for good or bad. I mean, a con artist, uh, the first thing they do is, is they focus on gaining your trust and having that rapport with you. It's just that they're intentions are are something other than good. Um, whereas I, I believe to persuade and to positively persuade with integrity and, and in a good direction, we still need that ability to establish rapport with people. Well, and in the book, you, you talk about that, um, you know, the influence that you had in magic and you talk about, you know, one of the world's most famous magicians, Harry Houdini, and, and you talk about that he spent a lifetime becoming a master at his craft and that the leader or and that the reader of this particular book can master the craft of persuasion by following Harry's example. And so for me, I was like, okay, does that mean it's going to take a lifetime? <laughs> you, you know what, Jim, everybody says that they they're like, Oh, this seems like it's going to take forever to master. And I'd say it's a journey. Uh, I'm still mastering it. I'm still learning every, every client I work with, every keynote speech I give, every customer I interact with every person, even every podcast, I, I, I walk away with some new distinction, some new learning. And I think when I, when I say, uh, you know, Harry Houdini, Harry Houdini, Dini spent a lifetime mastering. And I think anyone that's masterful at their craft will tell you that they're constantly learning. They're constantly refining. They're constantly tweaking. And so I think, you know, they say the first journey begins or the longest journey begins with the first step or the first mile. And it's the same with this. It's we've got to say, hey, is it worth putting the energy and investing the energy into this to learn to be better at persuading and influencing? And we'll get better every single day. And, and I would still suggest that at, after a lifetime, uh, at least in my case, and most people that I know that are what we would consider experts, they're still they're honing their craft. They're still learning and, and still practicing and still identifying things that can make us even better. So that, that's why I think, yeah, it can take a lifetime to master and every day we can make steps in that right direction. Okay. So, you know, in the book, you know, and this is one of the things that I think a lot of people also struggle with is, you know, the cognitive aspects of, of all of the things that are around us, as well as the subconscious. We talk about the subconscious mind, and it's kind of a, a scenario where it is a rocket ship, uh, but then the conscious mind is more like a turtle. Um, and it's a really vast difference and all that. And, and so when you start talking about where I should focus, because I want to start acquiring some of these skills, I want to start making an impact do I focus in on the subconscious mind or the conscious mind in order to start taking some of those steps forward? That's a, a really good question, Jim. I think first off, let's define both of those things for the sake of our listeners and, and those reading the book as well. It, the conscious mind is what you're currently paying attention to. And as psychologists will tell us that we're able to pay attention to consciously seven plus or minus two chunks of information. So that's five to nine pieces of information. And that's why phone numbers are the way they are, in, at least in, in North America, et cetera. So the, the more effectively we chunk or group things, in fact, we've got a, a, an example of this in the book on, on saying the alphabet backwards and, and how chunking a story will help us say the alphabet backwards very, very rapidly. Um, so I think the, the conscious mind is what we're currently paying attention to. The unconscious mind is everything other than that. So until I mention it, you're probably unaware of the way your feet feel resting on the floor. But notice as soon as I mention your feet resting on the floor or in your shoes, that pops into your conscious awareness. So it's just a matter of what am I consciously paying attention to? The unconscious mind processes, and I like the way you phrase that, like a rocket ship. It's so rapidly processing things more than we can comprehend consciously at any one moment in time. So I think it's a combination of both of those things, because as I direct my attention consciously to different things, things that were outside of my conscious awareness now become within my conscious awareness, kind of like the, you know, feet resting on the floor scenario outside of your awareness. As soon as I mention it pops into your awareness. So communication and mastering persuasion influence is very much like that. As I go through the chapters in the book, as I become more consciously aware, my unconscious mind will look for opportunities to uh, to engage, to utilize, to practice, and to pay attention to other things that are going to make me better at persuading and influencing. 
Well, okay. So, and I think the, the couple of things that we need to bring together, I think are critically important is that all of us have some type of operating system. You know, you talked about chunking, you know, some will naturally gravitate to chunking. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I need to continuously work on is, is remembering people's names. So I, and I, the system that I use obviously doesn't work very well because I will, my short-term memory doesn't hold on to that, you know, how hold on to names. And I'll ask, even after, you know, a minute or two of after hearing the name, what was that name again? Um, it's, and so I've got to work on that. Uh, I think all of us need to identify systems that we can better leverage in order to overcome uh, those uh, the issues that we're talking about. But, okay, so, but I also think, so hold on to that. Um, yeah. But I also think we have a significant problem because um, today more and more of our interactions aren't in proximity of one another, Right whether we're serving customers or whether we're leading people. Um, and that creates, you know, yet a different element that I think we need to bring more to our, our conscious mind. So what are some of the things that you think we need to focus on by, because we now are more remote and more dispersed than we ever have been before? Jim, I, I think one of the things is people focus on the differences. And when we've been brought in the last two years during this pandemic um, to deal with uh, sales forces, marketing teams, et cetera, uh, they're like, well, how do we sell virtually? How do we uh, you know, present more effectively virtually? And the, the ones that are focused on the differences are the ones that experience the most stress and the most sort of disconnection or, or discomfort in engaging. For me, I look at it as the same thing. I, I look at, you know, the, the camera is a set of eyes that are watching me. I've got a, a format in front of me. I, I can still use my gestures the way I would if I were in person. I can still look at you and pay attention and be curious as to how you're thinking. And if we focus on the similarities, I think it gives us a lot more confidence to engage in this fashion. We're still missing some more information, right? Like I'm only seeing you from the chest up. So I tell people, sit back a little bit so that people can see more of you and then use your gestures within the framework that you can actually observe so that you can have that impact. If you're talking about moving something forward, gesture and move it forward. So I, I think people uh, are focused on the differences. And I think what they need to focus on is what's the same? I've, I've got a person in front of me. How do I use my, my tone of voice? How do I view my gestures? So it, it's not just another talking head, you know, camera angle, lighting, all those things that, that people have become hopefully more aware of in the last couple of years during all this make a big difference in our ability to engage. And, and I think just genuinely being interested. The other thing is, and uh, I, I think, you know, you and I chatted uh, briefly uh, a little while ago and, and, and had to sort of reconnect and reschedule. I, I think just transparency with people and, and being human and being real. And I, I think when we do that and, and taking some breaks, I, I mean, when people are fatigued with Zoom and, and WebExes and all that, space it out a little bit, take some breaks and, and have some uh, real conversations as part of it. So I, I think from a leadership perspective, the last two years, that, that's the biggest piece of advice I can give people is be yourself, be real and, and focus on the similarities. We're, we're connecting in a slightly different way than we did pre uh, pandemic. And, and it's at least for the time being, it, it's in some cases uh, opened up our door. We talk to people more frequently in other parts of the world because of all this that we didn't talk to as frequently prior to this. And it's because we're used to this zoom way of doing things now. You know, it's really interesting that you say that. I mean, from talking about we all have our own operating system. I mean, I even find myself, um, and it goes back to what you said initially as far as rapport, right? How do you build rapport virtually that, uh, you know, you used to be able to build, you know, when you're in proximity of one another? Uh, and, and while, yes, of course, the platinum standard is having that face-to-face -face meeting, but, you know, that's not always going to happen. And if, and if I'm actually serving customers, I mean, it's just not part of the job. Uh, so I have to figure out ways to do it. So jokingly, one of the things that I, I do when I connect with somebody, I'll even do like a virtual fist bump. <laughs> <I'll> say, <"Boop." laughs> and it's yeah. amazing how when I stick my fist out to the camera where people will do the same thing to theirs. It's kind of funny. <laughs> And that's the first time I've heard that one, Jim. I'll have to share that one uh, whenever I'm talking to groups because it's true. Whenever you did that, it's like you feel a, an unconscious urge to kind of go, okay, I, I know what that is. Like I can fist bump. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we just right. have to look for things like that. Um, I, so I think thanks for sharing that. So, so talk about systems, you know, and, and you know, we talk about how do we make this shift. Um, you know, you say as a persuader um, that you can be, as smart as an octopus, and it's an acronym. 
so if you could please explain SMART uh, in regards to making a shift. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the octopus, Jim, because I think that's that's one of the interesting pieces of that chapter. When we were putting this chapter together, I, I kept thinking, you know what? Most people that have been in the sales arena are familiar with this SMART acronym, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timed. It's, and, and there's a bunch of other stuff that goes along with it that's outlined in detail in the book. Uh, what people miss sometimes is having that awareness of it, being able to write out what the acronym means uh, is, is a big difference being able to do that from actually applying the SMART model to our goals in our lives. And so we're, we're looking at how do we make this chapter interesting? And, and I love story. I think story is a way to bring things to life, uh, facts and data and things that people are familiar with. And so we were looking for a story to, to kind of get people's attention at the beginning of this chapter. And, and this researcher in um, Bermuda in, in uh, 1984 was doing some research and observing octopus. And, and what she discovered was that octopus were setting goals, that they were actually thinking ahead and doing behaviors that in some cases put them in short-term higher risk for long-term greater safety. And, and this occurred and, and was quite fascinating that, that you know, you, you see an octopus in the, in the zoo in a, in, a, in a fish tank or whatever, and you don't think, hey, this, this octopus is actually thinking in advance and setting goals. I never would have thought that. So I found this story interesting. And then in 2009, <clears throat> Another psychologist researcher in Australia was doing similar research with octopus and found the same thing, that they would move these shells around in, in to protect their caves in a way that would create shorter term risk for longer term gain. And I thought that's like goals. Sometimes we feel like we're risking stepping out of our comfort zone. We're risking failing. We're risking committing to an outcome because what if, and we get these what ifs in our head. What if it doesn't work? What if I don't succeed? What if, and all those negative what ifs create a sense of trepidation, fear, anxiety. And so I, I put the story in there because I think if we focus and are smart as an octopus, we'll get over that short term fear in order to gain that long-term success. And, and I think goal setting is one of the best ways that we can do that. So the, the SMART model ensures that our desired state is set up in a way, structured in a way that maximizes our opportunity to succeed and leverages, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, both the conscious and the unconscious mind. Because as we focus on those goals, our unconscious mind pays attention to things around us that are relevant to achieving those goals. Yeah, they, and these are a lot of things that we just we just never learn uh, in regards to our day-to-day uh, -day lives that become so vital uh, to us. Like I said, it, 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 to me, it's funny. Um, as human beings, part of our survival mechanism is, hey, to do what everybody else is doing because that way you won't stand out and get eaten, right? Um, but the fact is, is that we all want to you know, essentially achieve. We all want to be successful because if you were to ask somebody, Hey, as far as a goal in your life, do you want to be average? Who's going to, you know, agree with that and affirm to that. Um, but, and so therefore I've got to go and do these things that will in, enable to, you know, for me to make this shift because we are in, in a scenario right now um, where if, if we don't do things different, you know, in so many different ways, we're going down a very dire path. When you start looking at global warming, when you start looking at the conflicts around the world, when you start looking at conflicts within, you know, uh, own countries, um, you know, there, there's some things that have been happening where you are in Canada in regards to native populations and recognizing yeah. that. And I mean, it's just, we've got to do things differently. So if you could kind of run through SMART um, and how it fits into what, you know, what we're getting the opportunity to really take advantage of in this book. Yeah. So SMART is an acronym that makes it very easy for us to remember what's a, a well-formed outcome. So how do, how do I design a goal in a way that's going to maximize or optimize my ability to achieve it? So the S stands for specific, stated in the positive sensory based, for example. So what do we mean by that? The brain fails at processing negation. We cannot not think about something. So if I say, I don't want you to think of an elephant, notice the first thing through your head is an elephant. 
So if I say, I, you know, I don't want to miss this shot if I'm shooting basketball hoops, or I, I don't want to fall, or I don't want to fail, or I don't, anything that we're focused on not wanting, we tend to attract more of it into our lives for the reason that the brain fails at process and negation at an unconscious level. So when we say the S stands for stated in the positive, that's a critical thing, Jim, for people to get, it, our goals need to be stated in the positive if we're going to have a chance of succeeding them. Because if we're focused on what we don't want, Want, we're just going to get more of it. So the the, the whole acronym of SMART uh, takes us through each of those letters, the S, the M, the A, the R, and the T, and it maps out some things just like with the S, it's stated in the positive, sensory-based, and specific. It, it, the M is measurable and meaningful. Meaningful to whom? Because if I have a strong enough and a compelling enough why to accomplish this goal, my unconscious mind will find ways of getting me there. Uh, I'll give you an example, Jim. I, I when I started writing this book, and, and believe it or not, it's it's been literally ten years in the making. I, I put a, a, a file on my computer, and it, and the title of the file was "Best Selling Book." And I had no idea how I was going to make it a bestseller. I just knew that if I put that in my mind, if I set that as one of my specific goals, um, and even as I brainstormed the titles for it, it was like best-selling book. And then I put the titles down as I was brainstorming them. I, I, didn't, I didn't know how that was going to happen. And, and even as, as we move from, you know, thinking of self-publishing to getting a publisher, Morgan James Publishing, to through each of the steps, it, it's like stuff comes in your path when you've got a well-defined goal that may Maybe I would have ignored, even though it, I'm looking it right in the face. Whereas when I've got it well defined, my unconscious mind can scan and pay attention to that. The reticular activating system is something that's actually fascinating, Jim. It's like when we set out to accomplish something and we set that goal, we pay attention to things in our environment that we may have ignored otherwise. And those things help us as we move in the direction of our goal. So SMART is really, um, you know, we, we almost didn't put it into the book because I thought, oh, every salesperson on the planet knows this or every anybody that's been involved in sales. And I thought, yeah, but it, it's so critically important that people understand how to set outcomes effectively and, and well, um, well mapped out that uh, we wanted to make sure that they had it in detail in the book. Well, I, you know, as you're talking, I start, you know, thinking about some of the things that, you know, people have tried to leverage to, to, you know, get into this, you know, specific state into the positive, you know, sensory based, and, you know, some people will do affirmations. Some people talk about meditations and mindfulness. So, you know, I mean, again, there's a lot of different, if we start talking about, you know, vehicles to get us there, there's tons. Well, how do I know, you know, where I, if I'm, I could chase a lot of different things. Yeah. Right. How can I be more succinct and focused so that I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what's going to work for me? Yeah, so all, all these various things, mindfulness, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, visualization, end result imagery, we're talking essentially about the same thing, Jim. From a psychological perspective, um, anything we as human beings vividly imagine, our body and our nervous system respond as though it's real. And, and your listeners in, at, at home or wherever they are in a car, wherever they're listening, they, they can test this out. Imagine, you know, a, a time when you're going to bed at night, you're not quite awake, you're not quite asleep, you're kind of in that in-between zone. You think a certain thought and your body twitches or jerks. And when I ask audiences, every single person in the audience raises their hand that they've had that experience. Why is that so? It's because anything we vividly imagine, our nervous system and our body reacts as though it's real. So I, I think whether you call it end result imagery, whether you call it visualization, whether you call it what, what you're doing is you're harnessing your mind, your imagination, and you're moving it out in the direction of an outcome and a goal. And you're imagining things that your body and your nervous system are responding to as though it's real. So I think keeping focused on, on whatever that goal is, keeping it in front of you, keeping it post it on your fridge, keeping it in a, in a day book, keeping it on your, uh, your, your iPhone or whatever device you happen to be using and, and keep your brain focused on it because whatever we keep our brains focused on, we, we tend to manifest in our lives. And, and that's why I think some people manifest some, so much garbage around them uh, because they're focused on what they don't want. And, and one of the best pieces of advice I can give them is it's so you've told me enough about what you don't want. Let's, let's switch and focus on and, and shift and focus on what you do want. Let's map some of that out. And, and magically, almost magically like Houdini, they start to get more of that, what they do want. And it's because, they've changed their focus uh, and, and, and harness the way their brain actually works more effectively. You know, as I'm sitting here and I'm talking to all these different organizations that have people, um, you know, trying to develop 
uh, and lead other people. And to me, there's a, you know, the, there's a, unfortunately, we get the lines crossed way too many times in regards to managing uh, versus leading, right? Um, they are two extremely different things. They require different skill sets, you know, and we always talk about that we have a, this huge shortage in leadership. We have, you know, organizations that want to grow. There's no, there's no way that they can, you know, experience the growth that they want to grow with their current bench strength of leaders. You, you hear about this, you know, massive problem that exists. Um, well, okay, so let's hold on to that. And let's look at our education system. You know, um, what, let's talk about Western education, Prussian school system. You know, you do this, right? And this is the way that you do things. And you stay in line and you do this subject. And it's very rote learning. Um, and a lot of, a lot of you know, kids are very frustrated, rightfully so. It's like, I could just Google this. I don't need this. I don't, <laughs> you know, we've been saying that for decades, but now it's becoming more and more of an issue. Um, yeah. So much so that in order to keep them in the school system, we're medicating a lot of them. I mean, we start looking at all this. And then so then they get out into the workforce, hopefully. Um, and then are now dysfunctional people who can't do some of the things that we're talking about in regards to positive you know, focusing and goal setting and things like that, because I mean, you know, we've created a system to where anxiety is what we generate in the education system, not the ability to do some of the things that are in this book. How can, so, all right, so I'm not going to fix the school system, right? But I am an organization that is focused in on growth. Um, I need to have a lot of people. Uh, you talk about the clients that you work with, what are some of the steps that I need to take knowing uh, that people aren't going to have these skills when I hire them? I think, Jim, one of the, one of the first things is, is what you started off with, the difference between management um, versus leadership. And, and I think one of my acid tests, and I, I call it an acid test, just I don't even know where I got that name from. But we deal with so many you know, C-suite executives, higher-end leaders within leadership positions within companies. And my, my test is always, would I report to this person? Could I report to this person? And more often than not, Jim, I, I'm sure you experience the same thing. My, my answer is absolutely not. Um, they, they may be in a position of leadership because somebody moved them up and gave them a title. But when I watch the people and, and, and the people that report them and watch the dynamics of how they interact, um, I, I gotta, I gotta say, if those people weren't getting paychecks in a lot of cases, they wouldn't be following that leader. Uh, so it's more of a management dynamic than it is an actual leadership dynamic. And and I think those that are true leaders, you see people following them. They move companies. You see a, a bunch of other people following them to that other company. And we're, uh, you know, very blessed to be able to work with some of these leaders as they move from company to company. And one of the things that we see from the outside looking in is exactly what we're talking about. They move and people are willing to follow them. People that have been in a company for a long time will go. And, and we're always curious and say, you know, what got you to move? What got you to jump ship? What got you to move over there? Oh, so-and-so, they're such a great leader. And, and it's it's that ability to congruently walk that talk, to, to set that vision, to set that outcome, to set that smart goals, uh, those smart goals, and to be able to communicate that with the people that are following you and, and give them hope that this is achievable, we can accomplish this. And I think when that occurs, you get people willing to use their discretionary time, willing to go above and beyond. Uh, we have a, a friend of ours, one of my mentors, actually, and she was saying they've switched to a four day work week. And she said she was calling uh, the, the, something to do with the office. And, and she found out the controller and four other people were in on a Friday. And she said, what are you guys doing on a Friday? Like Fridays are off. And they're like, oh, we just need to make sure this gets done. And, and today's a perfect day for us to be in here. And it's quiet. And so so they didn't need to be there. But they've got Fridays off. Why were they there? Because the leadership of the company is so strong that people want to go above and beyond to make sure goals are accomplished. Okay. So, I, so, so we're talking about building, you know, a culture that is quite different than, than the norm. Uh, and ultimately what we need to be able to, to have is a scenario where the customer is actually experiencing all of that, right? Um, these impacts are being made. Um, you know, it's an inside out scenario. And, and so I'm, I'm looking and saying, okay, I need to be able to create or have an environment where there's more of those types of people doing these types of behaviors who are more, who have acquired a higher level of skill and emotional intelligence, persuasion and influence and all that, because the, it's going to impact the customer. And therefore the outcome of that is going to be 
more market share, more sales, whatever the case may be, right? So how do, how do I take the steps so that it's not just this core nucleus of, you know, a, a leader in his team, um, but it starts permeating throughout the entire organization? I, I think we've, we've got to realize, I read a book a number of years ago, you probably read, read it yourself. I see how many books you've got in your shelf there behind you. Good to Great by Jim uh, uh, Jim Collins, I believe it was. And he, he talks about sort of having the right people on the bus. And I think uh, we've got to have the right people on the bus. There, there are some people that are just not going to be uh, belong in the company. They're, they're going to have a different culture, different values, different attitude, different. And I think we've got to, we've got to weed those people out because there's nothing more detrimental to good company culture than a leader putting up with a, a, a bad individual. It's like the rotten apple in the bunch. And, and if we tolerate and put up with that, uh, that in and of itself destroys culture. So I think it, it takes courage, but we have to literally, we have to walk the talk ourselves. That's number one. And, and as we walk the talk, others will see that and, and, and hear that and, and, and watch and they'll be willing to follow. And, and I think then we need to make sure that we've got the right people on the bus. And if they don't belong there, they may fit and belong someplace else. Else. And, uh, and, you know, the best thing we can do is address that as quickly as possible. And, and uh, I, I think that takes more courage than some people are, are willing to do. And sometimes there's so much politics and red tape, it, it's easier just to like ride it through and let them stay than it is to deal with it and, and, and correct the situation. Um, I know of several people who are in senior level positions that do not have the ability to help people find a new career direction, right? It's like, I only, I can only work this system uh, that we have in place in regards to coaching and mentoring and things like that. But if it is one of those scenarios where, you know what, it's just, this isn't a right fit. You know, they can't even make conversation to say, you know what, this probably just isn't for you. You, you might want to start looking elsewhere. They can't even go there. So, I mean, I, I would dare to say that you're talking about you know, an organization and making a difference. There's certain core things that we need to address. And you probably see those consistently with the organizations that you have to work with. What are some of those things that's like, you know, can't do that no more. Yeah, I think one of the key things is attitude, Jim. We, we were uh, doing a coaching accreditation with one of our customers and one of the managers, he, he was a, a, a real character, just uh, everybody loved him, great leader. And uh, he said, look, he said, there's only so much work and energy I can put into changing the person. And he said, if you can't change the person, change the person. <laughs> and he he gestured like a, a dismissive kind of throwaway kind of gesture. And everybody cracked up laughing because uh, he's right. There's only so much energy we can put into a situation like a coaching situation. Managers will say to me, well, you know, is there such a per person as somebody who's uncoachable? And, and, I, and I say, well, what do you think? Have you attempted to coach people in the past and found that they were uncoachable? And, and every single time it's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. Uh, it, I, I think anybody can be coached. The question is, are they willing to be coached? Are, are they actively engaged or are they focused on becoming part of the solution or are they focused on becoming or, or maintaining part of the problem, being part of the problem? And I, one of my trainers who's, who's uh, deceased, but uh, somebody that I uh, learned a lot from over the years, uh, had a rule at one of, one of his trainings. He said, uh, I don't want to hear complaints unless the person you're complaining to is in a position to resolve it. If I hear you complaining to anybody other than someone who's in a position to resolve it, you'll be kicked out of the, out of the seminar. And, and I thought, oh, that's, uh, that's pretty harsh. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought he's right. And another thing he said is you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And, and if, if you're complaining to people that aren't in a position to do something about it, his belief was you're part of the problem. You're, you're creating that negative uh, aspect or that negative under, underlying um, dynamic in the culture. Whereas if you're talking to somebody who's in a position to do something about it, you're bringing about positive change. You're saying, hey, here's something that's not working. We need to do something about it. I'm going to bring it to someone who's in a position of uh, authority or whatever it is that can do something about it. And, and if I'm doing that, it, it's a positive thing in a good direction. Whereas if I'm just whining and complaining to people, uh, it, it just creates an, an under, under um, a, a subculture of negativity. So what I hear you saying is that oftentimes you find a lack of expectation setting that is in a, just not present. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think when we make those boundaries clear, when we put those rules in place, and, and, and I say rules, you can call them rules, you can call them guidelines, you can call them whatever you want. But I, I think from a leadership perspective, we need to make it clear what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, you know, who, who do we go to if we have problem A, B, C, or if we've got something that we see that is broken or needs fixed or needs changed, or we've got a, a way to improve things. And I think if we, from a leadership perspective, uh, position, create that culture of positivity, of, of openness, and, and of moving things in the right direction. Um, I, I think that's one of the, the secrets. Whereas if we tolerate that negativity and that, you know, backstabbing and talking behind people's backs and all that, then we're, we're just, you know, contributing to the problem instead of leading it in a, in a more effective and useful direction. So, I mean, you know, having a couple of kids. Um, so I've, I've got a, a daughter who is now entering her sophomore year at university. And I have a son who is a rising senior uh, and a son who is a rising eighth grader. Uh, when you start talking about the negativity elements and components, that's all that comes out of their mouth. They're teenagers, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so for me, I oftentimes inter interject on a lot of that negativity to set you know, a different expectation and to do some of the things like you were talking about, you know, flip the script, you know, don't look at the negative, flip it to the positive, right? Yeah. Um, don't complain about the thing that you feel. I mean, look at, look at the good side. I mean, but again, it's, it's a constant and continuous effort that has to take place. Uh, so how, you know, when we start talking about getting work done, when we start talking about serving customers, when you start talking about, you know, ha dealing with difficult situations, I mean, how, what kind of systems do we need to put in place so that it does become top of mind so that we are more resilient so that we do overcome? I mean, what are some of the things that you're, you're saying that, you know, have make it, made a difference in that area? I, I think one of the key things when we work within companies, one of the key things is creating a, a culture of accountability or, or if it's already there, making sure that it's paid attention to. And, and what I mean by that is we're talking about leadership. We're talking about levels of leadership or, or we can talk about levels of leadership. I, I think if, if I'm afraid to coach up, if I'm afraid to comment up, to hold uh, someone uh, that's above me accountable for things because I fear for my job or I fear for my my you know safety within within the work environment from a stability perspective. I, I think that's detrimental. I think if if we as leaders say, hey, it's okay to call me on this. I'm on this journey with you, and I'm learning this with you. And and if you know if I state something in the negative, and and one of the things that we encourage people to do is is set it up as a game almost. Uh, so we'll say. To a manager, tell, tell your group that you're going to state things in the negative, sometimes by mistake because you're human and sometimes on purpose as a test. And their job is to catch you and, and create an award system or a reward system where they don't know if you've made a mistake or if you've done it on purpose. So if they catch you stating something in the negative, then you feel comfortable and empowered to call them on it, not knowing if it was a test or if it was a mistake. And, and I think when we as leaders are in a position where we're willing to make ourselves vulnerable, uh, it encourages growth within the organization. Whereas if we're say, you know, we, yeah, sure, call me on it. I, you know, we're on this journey together. You can correct me as well. And then if, if we get corrected, you know, we say one thing, we react differently. And, and I think that then you get people that go, uh, go quiet around you. And I think that's the most detrimental when you have good people that are no longer willing to, to voice their opinion and stand up and, and, and communicate because they're, they've been told it's safe to do so, but their experience is different than that. And I think, Jim, that's one of the key things is their experience needs to be, if we say it's safe to, you know, call me on, on my stuff or call me on stating in the negative or whatever it might be, it needs to be an environment where they truly feel safe to do that. And so we set some of those things up as games sometimes. Well, and as you're saying that, uh, it goes back to, uh, you know, we didn't say these words exactly, but, you know, a good coach requires a good coachee, right? Yes. So, if I start thinking about, because we throw it out there and a lot of people do, they talk about psychological safety. They talk about incivility at work. They talk about all these things. It's uh, to me, it's like the expectation uh, it has to be on both sides. You know, so the expectation is, okay, I'm going to attempt to make it a psychological safe place, but then also you need to get a backbone, right? 
So it's like, okay, this is what it's good because you have to be resilient. We're dealing with tough problems, complex problems. You know, it's not going to be, you know, with a feather and a, and a whisper. It's just not going to, that's not the way it works. So, I mean, to me, I see you have to work both sides in order to elevate, you know, everyone. Yeah, we, we've got to be able to say it the way it is, right? We, we can't tiptoe around things sometimes. If, if something is violating a rule or something's done incorrectly according to standards or procedures, um, there's no point pretending it's okay. We, we've got to be able to have those open, honest conversations. And, and maybe it's somebody thinks there's a better way to do it and, and they're doing it a different way than what we're saying it should be done. Well, let's let's have that open dialogue in that conversation. And, and then it, it's a matter of, you know, is this a better way or is it not a better way? And, and is it something we can do or is it not something we can do? And, and I think focusing on the things that we can change is a much more uh, useful investment of energy than, than focusing on the things that we can't change. And, and sometimes we even see it uh, in Canada, uh, Jim, you know, sometimes head offices in the US or head offices overseas somewhere. And it's, uh, well, this is the way it's coming down. And and uh, so they, they, they've got things they have to do. It's, it, there's no choice, right? Because it's coming from somewhere higher up above somewhere else. Um, and, and in some cases, there are guidelines that can be operated within. There's, there's some flex in there, right? So I, I think it's really, um, really dependent on the, on the company and, and, and what the objectives are. Okay, so let's get down to actually the application piece. Because for me, you know, I look at emotional intelligence is all in here. Uh, neuro-linguistic programming, you know, that is in here. There's several different uh, positive psychology, you know, that's in. I mean, there's several things that are in here that allows us to apply uh, and improve, you know, our ability to, you know, make this shift. Um, but I'm, I'm an individual. It's, it starts with me. What are three things that I should be doing today? Yeah, I, I think n number one is the fact that you're thinking about doing three things today, I think is a start, right? Because some people get up in the morning, just do the same thing over again, and they go to bed that night and get up and, and there isn't, you know, what are the three things I should do today to improve my life, or or to, you know, get forward further forward, or, or whatever where the dynamics are. So I think number one thing is pick three things you're going to do today differently. And, and then, you know, make sure those three things are well defined, follow the smart model. And then you can measure success, you know, maybe you got two out of the three of those things done today. And those you know, three things that you decide you want to accomplish, Jim, could be very different than the three things I want to accomplish. And I'm sure, you know, having three kids, you've seen that they can have very different priorities and what they want to accomplish in a day. So I think it's it's really holding myself accountable to picking those three things or start with two if you want. But I think three is a good number. It gives you some choice in there, right? And, and if you hit two out of those three things at the end of the day, you're going to feel like a, a great sense of accomplishment. And if you hit three out of three, then maybe you, you you should have set four instead of three. And so, you know, push yourselves outside of that comfort zone. So I think, uh, I think you know, for anybody listening, I, I think you just nailed it with the question, right? What are the three things that I want to accomplish today? And, and if we wake up in the morning thinking that way, that in and of itself is, is going to create progress. Well, and then talking about goals and goal setting and moving forward and doing all that, you talked about how this book set in manuscript form and took forever and you never saw yourself doing it. Well, you finally did it. Uh, good job. Uh, but, you know, you also talk about the practice. You talk about, you know, a lot of different things associated with, you know, continuing to learn and grow. And so I started asking myself, what is one goal that you have that you can share? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's hard to narrow it down to one. I, I, I always have a bunch of goals and then I, I prioritize and reprioritize them. And, and uh, that, that's really how I approach things. In fact, I, just on the corner of my desk here, I, I've still got a binder. I'm, I'm kind of old school that way. I, I still like writing, writing things down and then I'll type them in sometimes, especially when it's goals, because I, I think you get that kinesthetic, that tactile, that, that actual writing it, which is it, to me, it, it just builds it in the nervous system better than if you're just typing on a computer. Computer. So I'll, I'll type it, but I'll first actually write it down, think it through, move it around on a piece of paper. Sometimes I'll use like old, old fashioned kind of cue cards and I'll write things on there and then I'll put them around and prioritize them. And it's, it's easy to move them around that way. Then I'll put it into a computer, put them in a document. So I think a uh, great, great question. I, I, one, one of my goals is, and we've got it booked, is a, a world cruise. We were on a five month world cruise. 
and got kicked off because of COVID halfway through. We got two and a half months through and got kicked off. We've got another one, God willing, booked for a, a year from now. And so uh, I've got that booked and in my plans. And, and I've got a, a bunch of other goals written down uh, that, are, that are similar to that. I, I love travel. I love adventure. I love meeting people and exploring different cultures. So for my wife and I not having kids, uh, we have the, the freedom to be able to do stuff like that. And, and things like Rat Neck, like you brought up earlier, is super important. We have a goal every year of, of you know, contributing a certain amount, being able to, to reach certain goals financially as, as we, you know, hit our own financial goals, being able to contribute financially. And, and I think that's also, for us at least, very important is, it's, you know, what can we do for others? How, how do we give back? How do we, how do we improve other people's lives as part of this journey? And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Stephen, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where I give you some short questions and you give short responses in rapid fire uh, to help us all move onward and upward faster. So, Stephen McGarvey, are you ready to hoedown? Ready to hoedown, Jim. <laughs> all right, so what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Uh, that's a good question. I would have to say uh, occasionally my own limiting beliefs. And so I work on those and modifying those and, and catching them. And, uh, and if, we, if we are all honest with ourselves, we all have to some extent or another limiting beliefs that come in once in a while that, that we need to pay attention to and modify them, update them and uh, turn them into more empowering beliefs. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, the best leadership advice I've ever received is walk the talk. And what do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Uh, best, I think emotional intelligence. I think that combination of EQ and IQ and that self-awareness and that ability to self-regulate based on that awareness. I think that's one of the key things to a, a good leader. And what would be one book you'd recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. Uh, any genre of book. Uh, well, the first book that pops into my head is, is the Bible based on my beliefs. I, I find it a fascinating history book. Uh, it, it, anything by Chip and, uh, Chip and Dan Heath. I, I love their books. Made to Stick, Switch, Decisive, uh, really, really good academic principles put into very readable. In fact, we when we were modeling, uh, it, we talked about modeling excellence at the beginning of our, our conversation today and how we can look at people that do something exceptionally well. We can actually you know, we can figure out what they're doing and learn to do it. And, and their books were ones that I've read multiple times in some cases, and that I wanted to model their, their ability to take facts, information, psychology, science, and build stories around it to make it interesting. And so uh, that's the feedback we're getting is that that we've managed to accomplish that by, again, modeling somebody else that but I really enjoyed their books. And so we did that with our book, Ignite a Shift. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information by going to fastleader.net and doing a search for Stephen McGarvey, um, or you can do Ignite a, Ignite a Shift. Okay, Stephen, this is my last Hump Day Hold On question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25, and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? Uh, that ability to understand how to build rapport, that ability to uh, be able to connect with people and give them the experience of being understood. Because I think when we have that one skill, uh, everything else can be accomplished. If, if we're missing that piece, then we're on a lonely journey by ourselves. And, and even writing this book, Jim, it, it took a whole team uh, to get it to where it is and to hit those bestseller lists. And so I, I think that ability to connect with people and give them that experience that we understand them. In fact, Jim, as a thank you for you, and, and your audience that's listening, I'm going to send you a link so that anybody listening can get a, a free e-version of our book. And, and that's my gift to you as a thank you for uh, having me on your show and, and for your audience to be able to, to, to really access this information and, and to be able to create that shift in their life that they're wanting to create. Because I believe we've captured the, the essence and the tools required to do that in this book. Uh, I mean, as I told you, I mean, you've done an excellent job. I mean, I've been tracking and following uh, the things that you reveal within this book and the, and the research and the background and all that for a couple of decades. And, um, you know, the, a lot, a lot of, a lot of insight and opportunity uh, for people to actually, you know, change their lives to talk about engaging mind, changing motions, driving behavior. Uh, you want to ignite a shift, you definitely get the book. Okay. So how does the fast leader Legion get in touch with you? 
They can get our website is Solutions in Mind, S O L U T I O N S in Mind, M I N D dot com. And that's the easiest way to get a hold of us. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn and, and most of the other social media. On, uh, they can reach me on there, Stephen McGarvey. And uh, I'll make sure I fire off the information to you as well, Jim, as part of that, that, that link to give them free access. I'll, I'll make sure we get that off to you uh, in the next day or so. Yeah, Stephen, Stephen McGarvey, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and helping us all get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 